Hello, Stephen Asma. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Jumati. Hao Peng Yo. Ni hao. Yeah. Ni hao. Oh, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Is, what, is that? Ni Tui Chin Zen Ma Yang. Is that how are you? What is that? What is, yeah. Yes, no, it's fantastic. What is it? Is it hello? How are you? Yeah, it means basically like um, ni hao means you good, good or or not good. Uh -huh. And if you need to wait, zin zin me yang means like uh, how you doing lately? How you been? Very good. Do you keep up with the with the language skills? Do you like um, stay up on it as much as you can? Or I can speak a little bit of Chinese, but okay, I, that's pretty good. I don't get to practice enough, but uh, our Chinese yeah. fans, uh, we have weird Chinese fans, just like we have weird every other kind of fan. And so Fantastic. welcome. Da Jia Hao. Isn't it? And nicely done. I was thinking recently I should, I should, I should pick up a language. I should brush yeah, up on Chinese a language or I should like, yeah, right. you think so? Or is it just foolhardy of me to think? What I would you go for? I'm not sure. That's what's interesting. I can sort of still handle French a little bit. Ah. So it's like I can sort of understand it. I can sort of read it if it's simple, you know, but I don't, I'm like, yeah, French, I suppose. What am I going to do? I mean, not that there's plenty to do with French. I mean, there's lots of places in the world. Well, how's your Italian? I have no Italian at all. I mean, it's like I can swear in Neapolitan because that's what I grew up hearing. <laughs> really? My father and my grandfather sometimes swear in Neapolitan. So that's about, that's, that's about. That's hilarious. Yeah, I can say really not really good awful things. things. Yeah, let's hear them. You can say really awful. No, 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 no. We'll get, we'll get canceled. By 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 our Italian fans, uh, but uh, yeah, Italian. Sure, my son speaks Italian. I'm like, yeah, I don't know. I always fancied I'd l I wouldn't mind learning like, I don't know. I, the Japanese was always interesting oh, to me. Yeah, Chinese, that's but a beautiful sounding language. Russian, Russian's a great. Oh my yeah, god, but Russian. Seems then tough. Russian, you have to just yeah, just a whole. Now, do you think Russian would be tougher than Chinese or Japanese or? I don't know because. Um, it's a good question. Like a lot of people think Chinese is one of the hardest languages, but then I'm told that English is actually one of the hardest languages to learn because of really? just the strange, like the, the system in Chinese, like the grammar is great. It's super simple. Uh -huh. And there's not really the kind of male, female pronouns. There's a lot of simple things, uh -huh. but the tones, the tones freak people out. Russian seems really hard to me too, but I've never studied Russian. Yeah, no, it, it's, it does seem hard. I have a friend who's Kind of, it's like a now at this point, it's like a second language, and wow. it's it does seem really hard. Here's the thing with me though, knowing me, I'll be like when I was a kid, I try, I bought myself a book to try to teach myself Icelandic when I was oh a kid. My Not that I mean, great language, amazing language. <laughs> I know why, but well, I think I just was like, oh, Vikings and stuff like that. So I tried to. But uh, knowing me, I'll be like, I'm going to try to learn Sanskrit or something <laughs> like that. You know what I mean? And it'll be like, you know, in college, I thought I'd be clever and try to get out of the language requirement by learning Anglo-Saxon. I was like, I'm going to, I mean, which is old English, which really? is. That was an option? Well, you could take an Anglo-Saxon class and it was like. That's cool. Yeah. And, you know, and surprisingly, it's. Enough not like English that it's like a foreign language. Oh, I believe it. But then, of course, I got I screwed myself because I took the one, because I thought, there's only one class of this, so I'll take that and, <laughs> ah, smart me, clever me, and I get to sit around and read, like, Beowulf and stuff like that, and that's cool. And we translate a lot of stuff. And then they told me, no, the, you need to really actually take this to a sort of another level. So I had to take these graduate student classes oh my God. in Anglo-Saxon. And those were really, like I was in there with these like high level guys yeah. and girls. And I just was like, boy, did I. Your plan backfired on you, <laughs> yeah, buddy. <laughs> it was it really, it completely backfired on me. And I remember very little. I remember one line from Beowulf. That I remember. Really? Well, there's two things. There's a great I love Beowulf. Beowulf and a lot of the poems and a lot of Be and Beowulf, a lot of the poems start with the word what? What? Which means like, what? you know, attend, listen. It's like, you know, oh, and that's does it? And that's how it starts. Yeah. Which is cool. But I think the line that I remember, this is just this is I I, I think you'll appreciate this, is I think I'm gonna say this right. Gaith a weird swahi o shell. Oh man, it sounds cool. Gaith a weird swahi o shell. Yeah, which means fate goes as it must. Whoa. And that's weird. The word weird. We get the word weird from W Y R D, which meant fate. Then. Oh, I and didn't know that. The word weird for us comes from that, which means 
faded in some way, something that seems oddly faded uh-huh. or like it's something something that involves a destiny or a fate with something that's yeah. become weird in our in our It language gives a too, whole new cool. blush to our wag on weirdos slogan. <laughs> uh, totally. <laughs> it's very, no, maybe very we nice. should end maybe we should end every broadcast with Gaitha Weird Swahi or Shell. <laughs> We should just do that. We should do that. Here's another one. One more thing, and then I'll move on from this, but this is good. The other word I remember, I think, I think is utwa, it was called, utwa. which means utwa, which I think I'm right about this. I could be wrong, which means dawn woe. And it describes the state of mind that you're in, that kind of heavy sense of loneliness and depression just before the dawn. Oh, shit. That's fantastic. Isn't that cool? Utwa. Yeah, utwa. Dawn woe, utwa. Is that from Beowulf? Is that where you're getting that from? Or that's just a... I don't remember what it's from. It's from something. It might be. But I think I'm right about that. And there's a word, too, that's wolflight, which is, I can't remember, wolflicht or something, which might actually uh-huh. be in German, too, which kind of means this sort of mysterious quality of light and that sort of moment of dawn just breaking, just before dawn, that kind of weird moment uh-huh. of kind of quiet and that kind of twilight in the morning kind of thing. That's cool. And... And J- Japanese has a lot of these words for these stra- yeah. very like precise idiosyncratic experiences or emotions that are, I really yeah. love that too. Yeah. Yeah. The Germans have that too. The Germans yeah. have all those weird kind of, you know, schadenfreude. Yeah. There's some great word for, there's a great word in German. I can't remember what it is now. And it's such a great word, but it's expressive of the embarrassment you feel for somebody else who's not embarrassed. They oh, should really? be embarrassed, <laughs> but they're not at your feeling, the embarrassment they should feel. And it, there's a word for that. We need to learn that, that word, is, yeah. Somebody somebody write in and tell us what that word yeah, is. <laughs> which I guess is basically like the concept of cringe, which is basically what sort of like, yeah. you know what I mean? The which German is the word sort for of, cringe, yeah. The German word basically for cringe oh steve things have already really started rolling here well this dovetails nicely with our request to our fans to uh to 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 share our our show to spread to share the good news that's right right it's sort of yeah we're embarrassed to ask that please share the good news we have a challenge a chin wan challenge which is just to to you know take an episode take your favorite episode take this episode and uh, just text it to your friends who have not yet discovered the chinwag. We want to generally disseminate this. We want to get more people. It's uh, hard to imagine, but there are a handful of people in the world who have not heard of the Chinwag no. podcast. We need to get to every corner of the earth. Totally, That's right. totally. We need to get the people of the Sentinel Islands. We want them listening we to us. Them. We want to get them. <laughs> we need them. <laughs> we need everybody. We want an army. We, we're, yes. we're tired of this. <laughs> right. We, we need our, what was it? I'm the king of Neptune. Is that what it was? We need the army to, to back me up because I'm the king of Neptune. Uh, <laughs> but do do keep doing that, please. Yes. And and continue to send questions and comments. And Yeah. Uh, and rank and review us at Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Yeah. And um, the, the community really does. We have a wonderful community. And... Um, they they help really not just sort of like keep our spirits up and we're reading all your stuff, but also it spreads the, it gets the algorithm going. So it's helpful in that sense too. <laughs> yes, so. it does. Yeah. Yes, it does. It boosts things up. That's always true. It gets things going. Well, fantastic. This is splendid already. Uh, but now it's going to get even better because we're going to move on to our amazing guest today. He's um, He's a very talented actor. He's kind of polymath guy like he can do sort of all yeah. things he he kind of write he writes great pieces that appear in magazines in new yorker and stuff yeah he's a great writer he's a really great writer and he's a very smart funny individual he's appeared in such films as the squid and the whale adventure land zombie land oh zombie land zombie land right yeah the social network now you see me and batman versus superman in which he essayed the role of Lex Luthor, which I thought he was he was great. He was great. Yeah. He's great. His latest movie is Sasquatch Sunset, and it is fantastic. It's a really great movie. It's a wonderful, strange, very interesting movie. It's so in the wheelhouse for the <laughs> chin wag. I just can't <laughs> it believe it. It really is. It's like they made it just for us. Yeah. Yeah, so we are... It's fantastic. It's a great movie. We are thrilled to have him join us on The Chinwag. Please welcome Jesse Eisenberg to the show.
Hello, Jesse. Well, hi. <laughs> Thanks for having me on your interesting new show. <laughs> Welcome to the Chinwag. Welcome to the Chinwag, Jesse. Hello. How are you? Thank you so much. Thank you. It's nice to see you. I was just telling you, I remember spending an interesting day with you once. Just we'll get this out of the way because oh, yeah. I just was like, do you remember? We were, I was, we were, sh I was shooting a movie in. F oh, I didn't think you would remember. No, no, of course. Yes, oh, that's so funny. I just said to these guys. You oh, it was like the coolest day of my whole life. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> oh, I tell everybody about it. It was, it was you and me and Laura Carmichael was in the car, was in the trip with us That's as well. right. Yeah. That's right. Yes, it was Laura as well. And we were in France. We were in like Northern France and we, they, they were working on a movie and I was up there with my ex-girlfriend, but we, but what was really uh, enlightening for me and so, and so cherished is that we, Laura had been called like unattractive on the internet and she was open with it. And I said, oh, this is all I'm called on the internet. It's awful. I, 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 I my entire public <laughs> life has just been a series of being called ugly in various ways. And then Paul, you said the funniest thing. You were like, I can't remember the exact show, but you were like, I go out in a diaper on a on a on a talk show. <laughs> wow. That's, That's I don't nice. remember that. But I but I definitely I do remember that that we all commiserated about the fact yeah. that we're called hideous yeah. on the internet. It's true, yes. And that was very nice. And we went to we went to Chartres. We went to the to the cathedral, right? That's right. We went yes. to see the, the, the famous cathedral with the beautiful with the amazing stained glass windows. Is it Paris? It very, yes. No, it's outside Paris, right? No, no. It, it's out, I, okay. Yeah, I don't in remember Normandy. where it is in France. Normandy. Is okay. that what it is, Normandy? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. the the interesting thing, and this will tie into your really interesting movie that what yeah. I want to ask that we want to ask you about, which is that it's the area we were in is the mushroom capital of the world. Uh, did you know that about that area? I didn't know that. No. Yeah, it's the it's the fungi capital of the world, and apparently people make pilgrimages to this area of the world because it's so just rife with crazy ass mushrooms and fungi. And oh, I had no idea. Presumably psychedelic mushrooms, probably too. Um, but it just makes me. It puts me in mind of the film that that we uh, were fortunate to see uh, uh, Sasquatch Sunset that you 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 have made. Thanks a lot. I am so surprised. I'm so pleasantly surprised to be asked on your show. And thank you so much for watching this unusual movie. It's a great movie. We loved it. It's right. It's it's my kind of my kind of movie. I mean, okay, I was like, I this is know. such a such a ballsy movie. And <laughs> I know. Yeah. And yeah. and it's and it's you do something quite crazy in it, which is it's a completely no dialogue in it, and it's about a yeah. group of Sasquatches living their lives and. Uh, and maybe, maybe perhaps the last group of Sasquatches in the world. And, <laughs> right. and, but you more, it's not even you pull it off. It's just a really great movie. It's yeah. like, it's a really, really compelling movie. Um, um, so thank you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Was this, was it your, was it your idea in any way or did they come to, did those gentlemen who directed the movie come to you? No, I've been friends with the brothers for 20 years almost. And we send each other everything we write. And so when they told me about, this script, it just sounded like something that they were writing. And, uh, you know, when they told me, oh, the characters are, you know, they have are dialogue free and you don't see them. I just thought, oh, that's wonderful. I didn't think about acting in it. I assumed they would cast people who are really good at movement. You know, it didn't seem like the kind of thing you would <laughs> right. necessarily require actors for. And then when I they sent me the script and I, I realized like two minutes into it, as probably do audiences, that like, oh, no, this is actually kind of a real it's it's it needs a real performance. It needs like a kind yeah. of spirit, a soul, a human quality that actors can provide. And so I just thought this yeah. is the most unusual thing, and it's really really good. As you say, they didn't just pull it off. It's actually just really really good, yeah. and also totally unusual. It's very unusual. I thought it would be kind of campy and sort of like this arch tone, but it's not. Mm -hmm. It's quite a it's not. quite a delicately handled, you know, like, and it's yes. quite, quite touching in places. So I, I thought it was wonderful. It's, it, oh, it's, well, it's you. funny, but it's not, but it's not sort of winking at the audience. No, in any way. it's not it's pitched like, comically. It's, it's pitched earnestly. No. And yet the yeah. humor comes from just the silliness of what people do in private, or in this case, what Sasquatches do in private. But the <laughs> yeah, humor is not, uh, you know, it's not, it's not trying to be comic. Yeah. No. It, it plays like a, uh, it could also be a story about our ancestors. You know, that's a sort mm -hmm. of how I was thinking of it. This is probably how right. our Homo erectus lived. And in that way, it's like really interesting too. Like how do they communicate? How do they eat? That kind of stuff. Do you think, and I know your history as a, a, a writer and a thinker, do you think that it, it, do you think that part of the value of Sasquatches in general is because they remind us of either our 
you know, ancestors totally. or just our connection uh -huh. to nature. Oh, I think that's exactly right. I think Paul and I talk about it all the time. And for us, it's um, a glimpse. It's like a, it's a, it's a fantasy about sort of pre-civilized humans. Mm -hmm. And we, we don't know that much about it, but we know enough to speculate. And so I love Sasquatch stories because it seems like, oh, this is what it must have been like to be Australopithecus or Homo erectus yeah. or something. Mm -hmm. This kind of between state of man yeah. kind of thing. It's a it's a it's an archetype, you know, it's a real archetype. The wild man, the man the of the woods, man. the kind yep. of the beast man kind of thing. Yep. It exists in so many cultures. In all kinds of cultures, yeah. Right. I mean there's that great in, in in England they have that great um there's a wild man thing but there's that great figure of the green man do you know that the green man is this kind of like it's this quasi wild man but he sort of lives in the woods and he's kind of covered in in kind of uh, fauna uh, flora as well as being sort of fauna he's like both things he's kind of vegetable and like oh, and wow. an animal and it's really and i thought it was great that you guys were herbivores in this too that it's like you know i mean <laughs> yes well i think one of the executive producers is a a, a vegan so i think there's a mandate from no no <laughs> oh, is that what yeah. it was? <laughs> no 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 i think really i like the, the there's like so much lore and mythology and you know I, I think maybe for every person who is a real obsessive and believer there's probably a a mythology for there's probably as many mythologies as there are people who are yeah. really kind of uh, are, are interested in this world. But no, so I but I'm sure one of the you know one of the the overriding theories is probably this herbivore diet. Yeah, well, gorillas are herbivores, right? Like they're they're the the big badass ones eat vegetables. Yeah, but chimps are are they eat a lot of meat? Chimps are just nasty. They'll kill each other and eat each other. It's crazy. Well, they will they eat each other? Do they commit cannibalism? Yeah, chimps? They, they do. Do they but really? It's more symbolic. Like it's like we, we you kill an enemy from another camp, and then they'll be do like cannibalism just to sh just like almost like this is what we can do. Really? And just leave the corpse. Yeah. Oh, wow. It's, it's really, oh, that's oh, so it's very a, it's psychologically, a, uh, sociologically difficult, complex of a, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. That's super kind of advanced in a way too. Exactly. I mean, yeah, to know that it's, that's really weird. I didn't know that. I knew they ate other kinds of monkeys. I knew that they killed and ate other kinds of monkeys, but I didn't know they killed each other. They do. And eat, eat each other. They ate well, they'll each like other. they'll. I don't want to get too <laughs> Sorry, gross Jesse. here, but they'll I'm like. <laughs> this is what I'm here for. But but the bonobos are just like the chimps, and the bonobos are like your sasquatches. They're like much more herbivores. Fruit they and they mm -hmm. just instead of fighting, they have sex as a way of like modulating the aggression and shit. Oh really? I spent a day last week with um the smartest non-human animal in the world, which is this 43-year-old bonobo called Kanzi. Uh -huh. uh, cool. He's in the Des Moines, cool. Iowa um ape initiative. And uh so what? Kanzi it's yeah, crazy. It was crazy. <laughs> yeah, tell me, this is amazing. Yeah, there's this incredible ape initiative in, in Des Moines where they, so the, these bonobo monkeys are only found in like the Democratic Republic of Congo um, in an area that's impossible for them to leave based on the geographical uh, difficulties around them, like the river, et cetera. And so, um, so there's these apes, there's not, I'm uh, sorry, Yes, there's these bonobos, nine of them in Des Moines. And Kanzi is the known, <laughs> you know, is the is the is the kind of um the patriarch and the smartest non-human animal. Uh and so Amazing. Kanzi knows like 300 symbols in order to indicate what he would like. And so when Kanzi wants, mm -hmm. for example, like pizza, he points to these symbols of cheese, bread, and surprise. And he works these <laughs> symbols out on his own. So, so, so he cool. saw cream cheese and he wanted to eat cream cheese and he pointed to uh, uh toothpaste cheese. <laughs> oh wow. That's sophisticated. That's, cool. That's amazing. That's very sophisticated. Yeah. But they did. I saw a lot of sex. Um yeah. just explicit, uh -huh. quick yeah. sex. And it was shivering yeah. orgasmic quick sex. <laughs> that's how it always works yeah, out for, for me. <laughs> and that's, uh, that's how it goes for Steve. And about the same amount of time. From now on, I'm, I'm calling pizza cheese bread surprise is what I'm calling <laughs> know, pizza. And I'm going to call gonna cream, cream cheese, cheese toothpaste cheese. I'm going to call it toothpaste cheese because I think that's really smart. That's fascinating. And that's, and you just, you visited this place you could, because you wanted to or because they... Um, I did, but we were actually doing, like it was part of this like kind of publicity thing where we thought we would show Kanzi the movie and to see how oh. Kanzi and the other bonobos reacted. And it's interesting because they do like love movies. They, in fact, Kanzi is so 
right that Kanzi will actually choose certain movies that he likes. I think he likes oh a certain God. kind of action that's not dangerous but thrilling. Um, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> you know, the 18 to 34 demographic. And so um, <laughs> I think, um, <laughs> and so um, so we kind of, we showed them, I mean, Kanzi smashed the screen just at a random point in the movie, I think, to show dominance. Oh. I, I don't think it was like oh. anger. It was just to kind of show dominance on whoever the, the shot was on. Was on the um, screen. Interesting. Yeah. And the screen is, of course, behind like a three inch plexiglass wall, which just indicated to me how much they must smash this screen. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. That is amazing. That's fascinating. And how do we know he's the smartest? This is measurable because they've just given him all these things and he's ma he's mastered this stuff. Yes. And so that's the indication. As soon as I heard he was the smartest, I felt, you know, jealous and then skeptical of the whole thing. Well, how is that possible? <laughs> uh, that, um, what test is he taking? Did you sure you get everybody? Um, <laughs> right. Does he have an SAT tutor? What is right. he? Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. I did very well in verbal. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think, I think like, I, I think um, he's been studied so much that yeah. I think it's not, I think it's that for all the yeah. data that they have on Bonobo, which is probably very limited again because of where they're kind of restricted geographically. Um, and, you know, Congo is also a, a war zone, so it's hard to kind of study, um, you know, it's hard to, mm -hmm. to get in there with scientists. So they're, they're really quite remote in, in, in the wild. And so I think just he's been the most studied, the most kind of um, mm. evaluated. But I think it's yeah. probably a pretty small group of those who can qualify as yeah. most intelligent. And then also, this is the most unbelievable thing. They are closer, to, these bonobos are closer to us than they are to, uh, to chips. Ah, so that's the other thing is that genetically yeah. we we share so much with these creatures that we dismiss, you know, don't acknowledge or are uncurious about as a culture. Um, and I'm sure there's even you know probably people who deny our connection based on maybe religious or yeah. philosophical uh -huh. ideas. And yet, and yet we really are so close to these creatures. I don't know what people are supposed to do with that information, but it's just fascinating <laughs> right. that we don't do anything with it. Have more random <laughs> right. sex with each other to modify our aggression. This is what I've been pitching. Yeah. I've been, yeah, it's yeah. constantly turned down. I tell my wife, but honey, did you see them? It's spontaneous. You see, the you see they don't. <laughs> and it doesn't know. have to last very long either. Yeah, yeah exactly. And quick. look, they go to work yeah. after everybody's fine. <laughs> Look, he's on his phone Merciful. now. It's fine. <laughs> well, one of the things in the film that you guys did, which I really liked, was there are there are these couple of moments where there's sort of like really rudimentary symbol use, like like the for sex, there's this kind of gesture where the hands are pounded together, and it's like. And then also, like, your character is counting things, too. It's really cool. Like, how do you get symbols? In yes, a the counting is interesting. Yeah. And yes. The, yeah, the counting, the kind of the kind of dawning intelligence of the one yeah. guy, exactly. of your That's guy, it. is sort of, he's on the cusp of something, and they are, they're about to be snuffed out, and he's on the cusp of something. <laughs> right. I mean, presumably, uh, and I, I hope I'm not giving anything away, but I probably am. But but these guys, it's a sunset because these might be the last ones, in, in a sense, yeah, right? Yeah, that's I mean, how I took it, too. Yeah. yeah, and it's not, and the movie is not like um, making a grand, uh, you know, political statement on, you know, no. extinction or anything, but there is this encroaching, uh, eerie human presence coming in. Yeah. And so the movie, again, is not, uh, you know, a polemic on 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 you know human degradation of the environment but but you just see yeah. it encroaching on their territory in a way that feels really eerie yeah there's something uncanny about the way it's filmed i think and also paul and i were admiring the the soundtrack and there's a weird like nostalgic the folk rock the kind of yeah the folk 70s, rock 80s kind of like vibe or something. soundtrack that's it no it sounded like those herzog movies was that yes. it sounded like those like heart of glass and all those like uh weird herzog movies like kind of 70s herzog movies there was like a mock trailer where he was going to be the narrator of the trailer <laughs> um <laughs> okay. that was definitely a reference <laughs> yeah and to me, it also just represents like Americana, like there's this kind of pioneering spirit of the West. So they're out there in the West. You see them kind of, there's almost this like, this feeling of like, like the, like, like the kind of mythology of the American pioneer, um, mm -hmm. of them walking ah. around, of them building something from scratch. And I think the soundtrack kind of gets at that. Oh, cool. Pastiche of that kind of idea. Oh, I hadn't thought of that as actually a sort of, they're these kind of proto pioneers. Exactly. It's true. And there's kind of no room for them anymore. W were you in California? Did you film it in California? I mean, it looks like it's Northern California. Yeah, exactly. So the Redwoods exist in this area that um, yeah, I, 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 I'm Redwoods. sure your listeners based on the work that you guys do uh, know of this area, but it's just the most astounding natural 
it's part beautiful. of our country. I mean, these redwoods, are, I, there's nothing like these in the world and they exist in this gorgeous- That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, it's in Northern California. Eureka is the city there and Arcata is uh -huh. the city. There's a college in Arcata. And it was just, it, it, I can only say that it never got old. You know, normally when you're working yeah. somewhere, you know, as you know, <laughs> better than anybody, Paul, you know, you're kind of in the same location. And even if it's beautiful and you're in a cathedral every day and it's beautiful, like after 30 days of a movie, you kind of get used to it. You know where the bathroom is. <laughs> yeah. so you're kind of, you know, but like um, <laughs> this, it just never got old being there. I was just in awe. That's cool. Yeah. Did you, it's interesting. I mean, you were talking when we about sort of, oh, you need somebody to be able to do a very physical performance here, which all of you mm. guys really did great. I mean, it was like you all were really physically fantastic because you were capturing the sort of, I and mean, then you got the iconic Bigfoot sort of strut, like right at the very <laughs> yeah, yeah, beginning yeah. to see all you guys the, have the that Patterson kind of great- Patterson Gimlin like, strut. Patterson Gimlin strut. Yeah, but strut, then yeah. it was also, is that what it's called? The Patterson Gimlin strut? <laughs> but that's and, the footage, sure. yeah. the famous footage of the same Yeah, year. yeah, yeah. But, and, and so, but then there was something very human about it and stuff like that. Had you ever been- required to do something sort of like, it's not mime exactly, but something to that really just kind of threw you back on kind of totally nonverbal and really, I mean, it wasn't totally nonverbal. Yeah, in fact, but. what you just said is exactly what it was. I I um I played Marcel Marceau in a movie like three years ago and my mind teacher, I studied with him for like a year and a half. And so I, um and and my mind teacher is this wonderful movement coach called, his name is Lauren Eric Salman. He, so he was my mind coach and um he studied under Marceau coincidentally. Wow. And so um when, 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 I, when we were all as a cast and directors talking about how we're going to kind of work on something that felt like both consistent, specific to our species yeah. and consistent with each other, but different enough based on what our characterizations needed to be, uh, we called Lauren in and we did like this kind of Sasquatch boot camp with Lauren <laughs> where we went over our vocabulary, the, the kind of the vocalizations we would make that would indicate X, Y, or Z. Uh -huh. um, and then the movement. And Lauren then worked with us individually. You know, my character is like the kind of thoughtful one, as you so generously put uh -huh. it, Paul. He's on the verge of like perhaps an intellectual breakthrough, um, <laughs> if you can yeah. count to five. And um, <laughs> yeah. and then um, Riley, who uh, uh, Riley Keough is just uh, so brilliant in the movie. She plays like the matriarch. She She's great. just determined that she needed to be more feral. You know, she was a woman. She was constantly breastfeeding. She was constantly cleaning up after the guys. Mm -hmm. And so it was this feeling of she just wants to be feral and she wanted to be a little slower. And so he worked with her on that. It was just such a weird, experimental, interesting thrill. The other character had like a strange, almost like mysticism to him because his his hand would almost have a he'd have a conversation with his hand almost, and it felt like he would well, get hilarious. He would get knowledge oh, yeah. this way. It's like he had an imaginary friend, but it was also yes. I and mean, it was like a child. It's, it's, exactly he was right. sort of a child, and he had an imaginary yeah. friend, but it was a kind of mystical channeling or something too. Unless it was accidental. <laughs> You know? I think it was probably a little of both that he, that it's this kid who's got, but I think also, you know, like when you're in touch with nature, you're given certain, you know, gifts, the way dog knows, the dog knows that you're coming home 20 minutes before you're there. And so there's a little bit of magical quality. I think, I think that's underpinning some of the mythology anyway, that there's this magical quality, which allows them to not be seen by us, you know, or yeah, to be yeah. seen so rarely. Right. I did have a moment of thinking, these guys are very out and about. Somebody surely would see them. <laughs> right, like right, somebody, right, exactly. You know, it's like, they're really, really, they're really out and about, these Sasquatches. But that's interesting. So it was the it was the mime instructor who even worked on vocalization and stuff like that with you? Yeah, I think, you know, maybe unlike a really big budget movie that would have been like, I don't know, parsed out, like somebody who, you know, a dialect coach, you know, from Quebec who can uh -huh, do uh -huh. um, You know, but I think with this, it was just like, you know, Lauren just lives in, Lauren is the, the the coach, as I mentioned, um, he just lives in this world of creating, of, you know, he, he studied clowning. And so I think it just overlaps with a lot of what his expertise is. Um, uh -huh. And the other thing is there's only like 10 words. There's only like 10 <laughs> right. versions of grunts. grunts. Yes. So it should right. require that right. Quebecois vocal teacher. I was sort of like, are you guys good? Because I was telling Steve, I was just reading this article recently about a guy who is the premier language inventor right now in the world. And he does it for movies. He's invented like 56 languages or wow. something like that. Oh and it's all like, it's not just like Klingon and stuff like that. It's all kinds of things and stuff. And I thought, oh my God, did you guys do that kind of thing? If we did, we would have we would have not taken full advantage of his services because we had like ten words. We're like we need right, ten, exactly. and we need them tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we loved Avatar, and we need ten words. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But that's interesting. You isn't your? I feel like I read somewhere was your mother a clown, or she yes. like worked as a clown and something like that. Is this true? Yeah, I have to say, I'm just in shock that I'm talking to like. 
<laughs> the coolest actor in the world and you did like your did talk his show. Work. Uh, you did your talk show bio. I, know. Uh, yeah, I did my, my talk show research. Yeah, you have my <laughs> Seth Meyers bullet points in front of you. Um, <laughs> I do, I do. I do, um, but I find that interesting. So you had some acquaintance with sort of like this kind of thing. It was in your life in some way. Yes, exactly. Yeah, my mom was a birthday party clown. So she did, she was kind of like coming out of what I would maybe um, characterize as like the hippie movement. So, you know, so she was like, kind of like everybody won the game. She was also like raised by socialists. So like it was this very sweet, <laughs> fun clown where you felt loved by the end of it and did games where the losers won because that's the way it should work and to each according to his need. And um, anyway, um, she, <laughs> um, and my clown. dad was like in academia. <laughs> And Marxist clowns. <laughs> What's that? Marxist clowns. I'm from an academic course, background. I yeah, I am too. Yeah. So my dad put kind of like, my dad was able to codify the arts in a way that made sense to me as a profession um, because he is a, you know, he's a, a sociology professor. And But my mom, you know, was really interesting. And I think of it now, I'm 40 and I think of just what my mom was at 40. She would get up, um, she, she would do parties all weekend. So she would get up at like six in the morning and you'd hear her tuning her guitar and blowing up all these animals. And there was like just a real seriousness to the silliness. <laughs> and it's cool. like, yeah, it's something I think actors, young actors, like struggle to get over this weird obstacle of like, I feel weird being silly and self-conscious, mm. but it just requires that strange mental leap. Once you make that mental leap, you're yeah. free and the world is yeah. fun and you're oyster and you can play. But yeah. it's just this weird yeah. mental leap of like, you know what? I don't have to think my job is silly. I could think it's as serious as any other job. And yeah. I'm just going to go there and live in there and take myself seriously. And so that's what my mom was doing and what was what she was kind of like unconsciously passing to me anyway. So to do this kind of movie, Sasquatch movie is like, oh. it's right up my alley. In fact, to do something where there's like no thoughts of vanity or my own performance style or whatever or thinking. 100%. If, I couldn't even recognize you for a while. I was like, which I guy is just you either. Is I was cool. actually confused which guy was you. I was like, which is, I was like, is he? Yeah. At the beginning for a while, I thought you were the, the alpha, the more, the kind of alpha, the, the alpha one who was sort of like, and I thought, yes. wow, he looks bigger than I remember him being. He must have like uh, worked out like for this or something. France trip. I guess it was the time change. All those mushrooms. Why was he complaining about his body all day in France? <laughs> I know. He's, 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 a, he's enormous. He's Czech. But, but I think so. That was cool because I did not recognize any of you, which was really cool. And the complete lack of vanity. I mean, that's what I said when I started watching. I was like, oh, my God, this must have been so much fun. This must have yeah. just been. Yeah. And and beyond fun. It must have been really, really freeing. You've played a primate, right? Paul, you've had all the makeup, but like you did the I did. Uh, I played I played a Planet of the Apes ape. Yeah, I played I did. I played a Planet of the Apes ape. Was that prosthetics or CG or what was that? No, it was prosthetics. It was still this was twenty years ago. It was a Tim Burton did this kind of weird, interesting reboot of the Planet of the Apes movies. And so it was prosthetics. It was all those Rick Baker. This is the one where he's at the Lincoln Memorial at the end? Yes. yes. Yeah, I saw that. That's yeah, yeah, yeah right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. And so it was all prosthetics, which was great. And it was it was probably, it was one of the funnest things I've ever done. But we still, we still talked, you know, mm. and it was like right, to, right, right. To, to take the, to take the verbalizing out of the thing would just be, I, I constantly am saying I, would love nothing more than to do something, a silent movie or something yeah. where I don't have to talk and just completely get thrown back on my body and face and stuff yeah. like that and my <laughs> eyes and things like that. It just seems like it's got to be heaven to just take that out of the equation because it's also like- It was, it was- Yeah, it's it's like basic, it's the most basic acting you can do. It's really cool. It's like, it's, it's taking it back to the most primal thing you could do. Exactly. And to be- also candid about it um, is that the the prosthetics and the suit were incredibly uncomfortable and difficult to oh, move really? in, and so as freeing as it was, it was also very constraining. But the constraint, in some ways, also made it possible to be unself conscious because you are literally just dealing with ha like walking across the walking across the forest in one shot is excruciatingly exhausting. I bet. And so, I bet. But in a way, that's like freeing too because you know I, yes. I I'm I'm, I'm I, like I have I'm, it's all about the physical yeah. now. You're in the, the mold. Yes, it's almost like it's like that kind of like you, you read about like Gurdjieff, you know Gurdjieff, you know that mystic Gurdjieff. The Russian He's mystic. He's this sort of mystic Russian mystic thinker who has this whole sort of, I mean, it's like all those kinds of these sorts of 
body therapeutic things you hear about kind of like they're painful. Like some of Gurdjieff's stuff is painful mm. and it's to mm. get you out of your head by getting you into this kind of painful sort of like physical position. Oh. I was thinking that you guys are walking across uneven ground in those costumes with yeah, huge yeah, fake yeah. feet on. And like it must have been, I, there's a shot of Riley walking through the snow and I was like, boy, that must not have been easy to walk through no, the snow no. in those things. And it's like, yeah, it's like. God, where was the uh, Gurdjieff meditation <laughs> podcast I could have listened to during the shooting? <laughs> Which one? Which there's so many. Listen, yeah. I would have been happy to have hired a Gurdjieff dance uh, routine specialist <laughs> and brought him to the set. Next time for, Se yeah, for yeah. Sasquatch Sunset 2, I'll bring a Gurdjieff <laughs> movement Thank you. guy to we the set. We need him on set to just calm us down, to explain that pain is part of the process of living and if you feel no pain you may as well be dead it's, it's so i think there is a little bit of that kind of thing i think yeah. it is a little bit of this pain kind of freeing you yeah well zen buddhists too talk about yeah there, it sounds buddhist actually yeah yeah that it's like that the the pain will open your mind that it's actually a sort of interesting way mm. and acting certainly is filled with a lot of pain isn't it yes. there's a lot of uh <laughs> There is. Yeah, I also, um, 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 please, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I just was, was going to call attention to, to some uh, work that I've read of you, Steve, uh, just about like importance of play. I had read your article about that and oh, it just cool. occurred to me as I, was as I was watching The Bonobos and then as I was acting in this movie, just retroactively thinking about it in anticipation of talking to you, just like the idea that there's like a certain playfulness with The Bonobos, I, which also translates into their sex. What they're, what they're doing with sex is not um, uh, mating. Yes, they they, mm -hmm. ex they experience yeah. sex like a kind of co-masturbatory yeah. experience. Totally, and um, and uh, and the Sasquatches they also kind of what, what we were thinking about a lot was just like there is seemingly no utility to some of what we're doing here. Like it's not mm -hmm. survival, and it's not um, it's yeah, it's not protection, it's not survival, it's not eating, it's not sleeping, right. it's not building a nest necessarily for shelter. But there's this some like play for its own sake. Yes, um, and the importance mm -hmm. of that for kind of social cohesion, and the bonobos do it. To an extreme, you know, yes, degree. Really? That's a great point. I mean, that the um, all mammals play, and this is something that Darwin noticed. And then this guy Yak Pangsep in the '90s was actually doing experiments on animals. I mean, watching them and looking at their brains, and found that they they release the same internal opioids and endorphins and dopamine when they really? do this rough and tumble play. And it's how they figure mm -hmm. out how their bodies work. Like they know, uh -huh. okay, that's too hard. That's too soft. Like, and so you'll see dominant. When I saw the gorillas in, um, in Rwanda, this, the alpha male, like the silverback, like one of the adolescents, it's just like this family of Sasquatch in the film. One of the adolescents is fucking around and wrestling the little one too hard. This alpha male comes out of nowhere, the silverback, and just wallops him. And just mm. hard enough to be like, we're done with that now. And then everybody gets in line. <laughs> and they're all, and so your characters in the film are sort of also like figuring out like, what what are their bodies doing? Like, what is, mm. you know, mm -hmm. am, am I going into heat? Do, what do I do with my, mm -hmm. you know, sexual equipment? And when do I apply that? Yeah. And it's really interesting. Right. Yeah. I visited those uh, mountain gorillas as well in Rwanda. Did and you? Awesome. Yeah. And it was just I fascinating. I really want to do that sometime. It's You've so surreal. You know, it's just a surreal experience. And just, yeah, watching, the, uh, there was something different about the bonobos, maybe because they were uh, um, enclosed and there for study. But the, the gorillas in Rwanda, yeah, it just felt like you were witnessing something that they were completely unaware of. Yeah. The bonobos were very interactive, which I guess maybe is attributable to their higher intelligence, possibly. I don't know. Did you feel threatened at all with the gorillas? Did you feel like, oh shit, I could make a wrong move here no. and get okay menaced in any no, way? No, I literally felt like they were completely unaware of our presence. Are they just really accustomed to people being there. They must be all the time. Yeah, that's what I assumed. We were also with you know um, local guards, and one of them had a, yeah. a gun, which they don't deploy on the animals. But it's yeah. like if, if yeah. worst case scenario, they'll do like a warning shot or something like that. And so perhaps there's something that happens with these gorillas that they're they know to not interfere. They do this kind of cooing with their voice. The, the humans use a cooing and grunting that actually the gorilla will calm the gorilla down. Like there's a weird crossover language of like emotional language that that we can share with our primate cousins. It's kind of cool. Yeah, it's a sound. It's a kind of like throat. It's like an ASMR for gorillas. It's a kind of like soothing sound. 
I've been around chimpanzees, and chimpanzees are menacing. They feel yeah. more menacing. Mm. They don't feel, they feel more actively kind of like there's, there's the threat of violence feels like it's always under the surface around them, mm. even the little ones. They just feel very aggressively in your face. But that may also be because I was around ones that have been they're assholes. handled and trained. And <laughs> they're so they're, yeah. Assholes. So it's like they, they're a little spoiled maybe, and they want, they think they're going to get something out of you. So they're sort of in your face a lot. But the sense of like menace is actually kind of present with chimpanzees. Mm. in an interesting way. Yeah, I wonder if they feel more threatened by us because of a similarity. Well, maybe. Uh, maybe, yeah. Because one of the directors of this movie is very tall. Like the rest of us are like average height and the director of this movie is very tall and they were, through the glass, they were coming over and really hitting him. Oh, there was really? this feeling of, oh yeah, you're the dominant one in that group oh. and so we have to kind of- Because you're the big one. Exactly, Yeah. And I wanted to tell the uh, I wanted to tell them actually um, you know it was co-directed there were equal credits and uh, you know explain that there was not, not a hierarchy dominant. here. <laughs> yeah, there's another. And then in some way the actors were helpful in getting the financing, so actually it's more complicated than you're thinking. <laughs> But do you believe in in the possible existence of Sasquatch? This is kind of yeah. just a point blank question. But do, Wait, what do you this think? is a big thing with us here: is finding <laughs> out what people really believe or don't believe. So, are, do you have any room for it? I'm not one of these people that like decides to have my own thoughts about something that I know nothing about. Like oh, I don't, <laughs> that doesn't stop us. <laughs> that's re that's that's refreshing. I know that's, that's yeah. quite refreshing to the point where, like, you know, I grew up in a very liberal family. I'm a very liberal kind of person, but I have like ten minute conversations with a Republican. I have to call my dad after. I was like, Dad, I think I just got turned to a Republican. I, I, I basically, <laughs> I'm, I'm so swayed by confident people explaining things slowly to me. And so- That's um, interesting. So with this thing, like, oh, I don't know. We, we were shooting with crew members who are locals up there and genuinely believe they exist and have airtight uh, logic about why we haven't seen them or why this bone meant this thing. And, you know, I, I, I don't know anything about this thing. All I know is that, like, they serve some purpose for us as a species and we are self-centered species. And so, like, I wonder, like, what is the value that these creatures serve for, for our species? And I think, for me, having done this movie and think, thought about it a lot, is that, you know, we are increasingly removed from our natural world, obviously. I'm not saying anything new. And these, and Sasquatches increasingly represent the link that is diminishing in yeah. our lives. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. Sasquatches, I think, have this incredible uh, value for the human experience. Whether or not they actually exist, I don't know. I don't know. I'm easily swayed. But, you know, all these <laughs> cultures, as you alluded to, Paul, have concurrently similar creations. Mm. And so it tells me that there's some human need for this to be real, for the mythology to exist. And that's not something I was like eager to get into an argument about logic with, <laughs> with somebody right. who actually feels this way. Yeah. Yeah. We talk about this a lot because it's a kind of imaginative, emotional hunger for these things to that's sort it. of like assuage certain things. Uh, but all of these things, potentially UFOs and aliens and all of this stuff has the potential to kind of be sort of soothing in some way to people or deliver some kind of meaningful thing. To exactly. People. Do you feel, I mean, yeah, religion does a similar kind of, you know, uh, uh, sound yeah. as original something. Do you feel one way or the other on the existence of Sasquatches? Uh, I mean, it's, uh, there are people who believe that they could, I mean, they're discovering sort of species of creatures all the, they're discovering new animals all the mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, birds, insects, right. mostly, mostly pretty small, small ones. Yeah. You see, yeah, that, 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 yeah. tall, that, yeah. In California, that, where everybody has yeah, a camera. Not, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> not, not exactly that kind of thing. So it's like, you know, there are some people, I believe like Jane Goodall actually thinks that they yeah. could exist, she right? Oh, that, yeah. that, you know, yeah. as somebody as like reliable as Jane Goodall is sitting there saying that there's a possibility there is some race of primates that could exist. So I go, okay, I'm more with you that it's like, it's it's actually what's valuable about them is that, you know, is the kind of like, I used to say about alien abduction stuff. I was sort of fascinated by that and, and aliens. And I also, you know, to actually suddenly prove to me the existence of them might actually be less interesting than mm. never knowing if they exist, but getting the nurturing imaginative uh, <laughs> yeah, effect yeah. of them might actually be more, it's more useful in a way than if they actually existed. Yes, you know exactly. I mean? Like there's- Yeah, because they're in the mythology of our minds. They're filling yeah. in the blank for yeah. us. Yeah, and that it's it's doing something for us psychically. I'm a skeptic on, on most things, but strangely Bigfoot like yeah. is one of these places <laughs> where I'm much more open to its existence because 
I think you would only need a small interbreeding population. There's huge parts of the country where there's like no people. I mean, it just mm -hmm. really is just empty. And in that area, there's a very low human population. The one theory I like is that there's a giant ape that lived in Asia at the same time as our ancestors called Gigantopithecus blackie, and it was huge. It matches the Bigfoot, and um, it may have come across on the Bering Land Strait. I can't believe I'm saying this, and it's living in. <laughs> uh, no, no, it's great. Yeah, yeah. amazing. Your it's your tough. tenure is about to be taken away. Yeah, from exactly you. right. Yeah. 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 Don't don't yeah. I have yeah. tenure already. <laughs> exactly. At the latest faculty <laughs> meeting. Well, your tenure might be taken away after this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they can take away, but they can't take <laughs> uh, gigantus <laughs> yeah. away. <laughs> so your theory is they came over here on the on the Bering Land Bridge, and they. They went underground in Mount Shasta, and they. I, so the I, funny thing is, I believe a lot of wacky shit, but I don't. Yeah, actually, you're interdimensional, fucking Bigfoot. Yeah, and I know. Stuff. I, At least yeah, not, I have all kinds of like, yeah, but it. But so they somehow just survived because they went underground or something, and they just. Yeah, they just. There, it's a small population that continues to live in the woods, and I do think it's very unlikely because of their size, and eventually you'd see bones, and you'd see you, but. Again, I people have thought uh, there's no such thing as a giant squid, and or they thought you know there's no coelacanth, and yet we found these mm -hmm. examples. So that's why I'm, the the orangutan the orangutan was a sort of mythical, legendary yeah. creature. I mean, which is really? why there was this kind of crazy, crazy vogue for orangutans in like the 19th century. It's like Poe writing the orangutan murder story, oh, murders know. in the Rue Morgue, because they discovered orang, but because the Western world discovered orangutans, and they were like, oh, these fucking things are real. Whereas it oh. was sort of assumed to be this kind of legend from out of Borneo or whatever. Oh, or that's so interesting. Are. Stephen has a very interesting, you might find this interesting, Jesse. Stephen has a really interesting take and definition of kind of monsters, of what a monster's function is. Mm. Um, you know, Steve, when you talk about it's the thing that is sort of the other that makes us, I mean, it's the thing that you, you've defined it before as kind of... I have like 10 definitions, man. <laughs> Which one is this? <laughs> yeah, but it's it's the one where you talk about it's the it's the thing that it's it's everything we aren't. It's everything oh, yeah, we yeah. kind of it's sort yeah, of Yeah, it's like the other that you then you project all your fears and anxieties into and and then also you can't really negotiate with it. Like with That's it. Yeah, with with most other evil doers or or enemies, you you can have share rationality with them so you can negotiate mm. with them. But the monster is something that's you can't find common ground or rational, you know, um, negotiation with them. So it's, and I think like the Sasquatch is sort of, it, and some of these monsters are sort of in between. Like you, you've done a few zombie zombie movies, and the zombies like this, you can't you can't reason with a zombie. They just right. want to eat your brain. There's no common yeah. yes. There's no common negotiating tool, which is which is a kind of a different perspective on it. But it's an interesting way of thinking of it. That it's very this thing interesting. That it's actually as opposed to the thing that's nurturing us in some way. Maybe it's the thing that's so other. We need that too in some weird way too. Right, right, right. The thing that's so scary that all the tactics you learn as a human being to deal with the world when you're a child to deal with adults. Well, maybe I could make this compromise. Right. When that disappears, it's incredibly right. scary. It's mother nature. It's, it's a tornado, yeah. but embodied in a physical thing that has malice. Yeah. Yeah. Or, yeah. Or something, or it's just so different that it, right. you can't sort of access it. Yeah. That is just so odd and different. Yeah. That's interesting. Are you a science fiction fan? Are you like a- No. No, I'm, I, you know, I'm, a horror I, fan? you know, I, no, I'm not really, I, I understand. I mean, I like Kurt Vonnegut, but those are, I would say more like humor forward, uh. um, you know, um, <laughs> so not really, I just have trouble again. Like I just have, like, I can't make the mental leap. Even when I watch like a normal movie, if there's like a red car driving in the background, I'm just so stupid that I assume, oh, we just have to be, we have to be following this red car now instead of like <laughs> following the conversations. Happening. So science fiction to me, where it feels like the rules, I, I'm going to get, People will hate me for saying this, but no, 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 no. I'm. This is interesting. I'm such a kind of like literal person that when I see like science fiction, to me, it feels like oh, the rules can suddenly change, and mm. you know, oh, but of course, it wasn't affect me because it's Wednesday and I have these powers <laughs> with the marshmallow in my hand. It feels always felt to me like this arbitrary set of rule breaking, and I think it just turned me off as a kid because I was so like I think I was just so worried about breaking a rule and so terrified. So like science fiction 
I also could have seen a parallel universe, Jesse, which is science fiction, saying, this is the one place I find myself. But it turned out I was the literal Jesse who said, this is terrifying to me. I could just get beaten up for the wrong thing. <laughs> That's amazing. That's interesting. That's really fascinating, though. But you've... Give me, give me a recommendation or something. What should I do? What's of, a starter? Of science thing? Well, fiction? Paul is a... Is is a big science fiction fan. Give me the give me the starter. Have you ever read Lathe of Heaven? This is the one I always recommend to people. It's like it's it's, it's Ursula K. Le Guin. It's it's a, it's you know, and it's I always think that's a kind of good one to start with. It's a kind okay. of basic good science fiction novel, and it's not so much science fiction in a way, but I recommend it. Lathe of Heaven is a really great book. Mm -hmm. If you're not a science fiction person, I always think it's a good one because it's no, sort no, great, of great. Great, I, I need a it's gateway. Gentle. Uh, yeah, yeah. A gateway so book. you can do, but that's interesting with, with Taoist themes. Yeah, yeah that's Taoism. Yeah. There's a whole kind of Taoist oh, thing to it, and it's like there's there's a lot of yeah, and there's there's all kinds of interesting. She does a wonderful kind of turnaround about sort of world peace and stuff it's really mm -hmm. it's 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 really an interesting it's a it's a really good basic kind of book but that's so i mean but there you are doing sasquatch so all the more power to you to like <laughs> jump into a rubber suit and walk around and like do this all by the way what and, it's, and again i don't think i'm giving anything away about the movie this is something what relationship is your character to the other people? Because it's oh. interesting. I was like, is he like uh -huh. the wise man shaman who's kind <laughs> yes, of attached exactly. himself? Or is he just the son? <laughs> or, or is he is he the brother? Is he is he the uncle? Is he yeah, is he the drug dealer? What is he doing? <laughs> yeah, I think <laughs> so. Our just like our kind of shorthand was like that. There's this alpha, and then there's the female alpha male, a female, and so they have this baby together, which is the child that you see in the movie, and yeah. then the baby that's uh -huh. born in the movie, and. I was like a lost soul, the poet uh -huh. who wound up, you know, uh, yeah. you know, maybe on a spiritual journey that finally, you know, <laughs> yes. that, you know, That's three days after my spiritual journey began, I'm like, I got to find people, Jesus. And I found <laughs> yes, <them>. yes. <laughs> yes, which is That's really great. great because you get, you get that from it. You get yeah, from yeah, it that he's do. kind of the guy, he's kind of the sort of hippie uncle, yeah. quote unquote, who's sort of yes, attached himself. Exactly. Yeah, did two years at an Ivy, and then, uh, you know. Kind yeah, of he has escaped. to, like, wind himself up, like, a, almost like a romantic, like a Blakeian romantic by hugging a tree to get himself ready for a possible yeah. sex scenario. Yeah, it's really, that's very it's awesome. Exactly. Yeah. That's great. And that's what I think is so also special about the link of Sasquatch is that, that they can have, like, maybe within that kind of small realm of their, of their you know, link, um, to animalistic, that that you could find a guy like me, that I'm on one end of the spectrum as the kind of thoughtful yeah. beta. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that's interesting too, because you were talking to Steve before about sort of the play and everything shaping people, their yeah. ability. I think in Wolf Packs, I remember reading in Wolf Packs that there's a kind of, and I think all that alpha stuff is being questioned now, because I remember reading something that the guy who invented the whole concept of alpha is now like, everybody's misunderstood it and mm -hmm. I'm rethinking it and I'm not so sure that's exactly how it works and it's it's more nuanced than that, it's more complicated than that. Try explaining but that theory to an alpha though. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Actually, sir, Very if I point. may, that was a theory that was... <laughs> <laughs> you know what, I, 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 look upon, I see you in a much more nuanced way, <laughs> sir. Yeah, <laughs> totally, yes. It's just... Hold on I'll a moment. my pardon. Uh, <laughs> yeah, totally. So let's talk about this. But that there is a sort of, that there's a, that there is definitely a kind of more beta or lower level male who becomes kind of the guy who hangs out with the young ones, the kids, and mm. kind of like plays with them as well. That's right. That he's kind of the like kooky uncle who yes. like, they kind of leave the yeah. kids with him and he hangs out. And that's what he does because he doesn't, he's not aggressive enough to be the leader actually you know, out there doing all the aggressive hunting or whatever, he's he's kind of training them and playing with them, which is really kind of sweet. I it's thought, my sweet. God, there's and some sweet wolf who's really like kind of <laughs> like <laughs> sweet natured. I know yeah, the yeah. sweet natured one who's like, go play with Uncle St you know, Uncle <laughs> Uncle Bob, and you know, and everything will be fine. He's actually like totally cool. Like he's a total wolf, <laughs> but he's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> totally. There's one. Totally. Uh, uh, there's one group of baboons they studied, and the alpha males were just jerks. And they had all these like lower ranking males who were much kinder and connected to the young. And they were feeding at one of these dump sites in Africa. And, and the males ate all, they because they get to eat first, the alphas, they ate all this poison rotten food and it killed them. And as a result of that, these betas rose Good. to being the new the new culture of the whole group. That's fascinating. Like everybody was more chill after that, and it passed down like for generations. Yeah. Were they really? Was it kind of a more peaceful? Yes. 
Really? Yeah. So it's a more peaceful group of, <laughs> yeah. and that cool. yeah. group did okay? They did okay. They didn't get yes. their asses kicked nope. by everybody else? Nope. Really? Yeah. That is fascinating. There is a similar story on, and there was like an island in Indonesia a long time ago where the rich people were all washing their rice so that they could have clean white rice. Uh -huh. But what they were actually washing off was the B vitamins. So the poor people survived and the rich people were killed off because of this clean need to have, you know, we need that again. We need to bring that right some rice. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, there's some good ideas. We're, we're coming up with yeah. some good <laughs> ideas here. <laughs> For who? Kind of, we go like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. That's fascinating. That's super fascinating. Wow, interesting. Paul, may I ask you a question, if you don't mind? Please, please. No, please. And that's actually encouraged here on our show. Please ask us oh, questions. Oh, wonderful. Um, just, I am I have to say, I'm a bit surprised by your interest in sci-fi because I, I know you just a little bit and I think of you as really quite um, similar to me and I feel very connected to you when I watch you. It feels like <laughs> your performance is the way I view the world. And um, uh -huh. <laughs> and I'm wondering how you reconcile your clear interest in the human experience. Interesting. Your interest in the neurotic, your interest in, in, in this, like the nuance of a human life. Um, how do you reconcile that with this broad spectrum fantasy? Interesting question. Wow, yeah. that's a really interesting question. And I'm not one that I necessarily know I can answer easily, but I know what you mean. And it's like, that's this just makes me think of something funny. I was having a conversation with some friends of mine last night and they were like, you know, they started talking, somebody started talking about Dostoevsky. And I was like, I can't stand Dostoevsky. And they were like, really? You seem like a Dostoevsky, an actor. <laughs> like you, everything you do mm. seems to be playing this kind of pain, yes, existential kind of pain yes. and neurosis. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, I can't, I can't stand it. Partially, I think, because his voice is so relentless that it's like, I just, uh, and I, I think maybe I have it going in my head enough already that I just don't want oh, I see. And there might be something to that in terms of science fiction. It takes me mm -hmm. out of something very, yeah, I mean, it's purely escape, but it's not, but, but this is interesting why I suggest you to read the book I just suggested you to read, because it's not, I think you'll find it's very humanistic and very sort of human-centered. And I think the science fiction I like tends to be like that. I think I tend to like the more philosophical, like Philip K. Dick or Ursula K. Le Guin. I don't know that I love the sort of like hard science-y stuff, but it's interesting to me, all that stuff too. I mean, I think that it's, it's positing all these possible ways that humans can be better than themselves or it's it's delving into why we're not better it's uh -huh. delving into i mean i think at at its best it is very human and humane mm -hmm. when it's good mm -hmm. you know i mean i think i think it is you know so i don't i don't know that i think it's a that it's that it that depart that much of departure no not and really. what about the humor you're not alone in finding it surprising that i am lots of people are surprised so please Godspeed. Thank Continue you so on much. your your wonderful Thank you. publicity yeah. tour for this great movie. Yeah. A really, really You're great. You're so movie. kind to do this. Thank you so much for using your really interesting platform for this kind of movie. I really appreciate that. Oh no, it's it's our pleasure. It was a real pleasure yeah. talking to you. It was really great. Thank it was you. Really great. And nice nice to see you again, Jesse. You too. You too. Ah, that was splendid. That was splendid. Yeah, that is a uh, it, there's a very smart actor, and um, it was really interesting to hear his take on you know uh, not just the film but also like acting as play. And we talked about science fiction. Mm -hmm. It was fascinating. Great. Yeah, great stuff. That no, was really cool and and super interesting. Touched on a lot of really touched on sort of general primate stuff. In, yeah, which was really that cool. That was cool because I'm like, ah, oh, makes me go. I want to talk about primates more. I didn't really know that about bonobos and all that kind of stuff. That's really cool. Yeah, and he's done. He's actually gone and seen like the gorillas in Rwanda and then the bonobos in Des yeah. Moines, which just cracks me up. Des Moines, Iowa is where <laughs> yes, a bunch really, of bonobos. Yes, <laughs> so. All the bonobos. And one of these days, I'm telling you, I'm going to get to. Man, I gotta get to see the. Gorillas. Let's go. That's like. A, Let's have a chinwag uh, trip there. Should we? Yes. And we could just be out there with a live unit, like <laughs> just. Uh, <laughs> I listen. I would do it. It's, it's, it's that is a lifelong goal of mine, and and also to be in a Bigfoot movie. Quick, quick little interesting thing. I met Andy Circus once, oh. and I said to him, "Have you ever thought of doing a Neanderthal man movie, like a caveman movie?" And he was like, "As a matter of fact, yes." And he, I was like, really? I was like, well, if you ever do one, count me in, brother. Oh, I want to play God. in the Andrew. That'd be I've, great. Yeah. He's a natural. Never he heard be perfect. from him. Oh, it's not too late. 
He's probably been trying to email. Check your spam filter. There's probably a bunch of emails in there, Paul. Really? I've got the Paul, Neanderthal. Paul, the Neanderthal the, Paul, Paul, where are you? The Neanderthal <laughs> film is on. Oh, Jesus. I would I would love to play. I'd love to play a caveman. I think I'd be very good as a caveman. Yeah. I don't have to be an old caveman now. You've done a lot of primate work in your past, too. So <laughs> I <laughs> have. The, I have. Arguably, a lot of the characters <laughs> I play have a primate quality to them. <laughs> So, you know. Uh, You'd yeah, be the but, elderly oh God, uh, Neanderthal it. that they have to sort of euthanize because you can't keep up with the with, great. <laughs> with the tribe. Great. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Thanks a lot. <laughs> I mean that, that in the best way possible, man. <laughs> they have to stone me to death. Right. It's like, you know, let's, this guy is just extra baggage. I'd be like, but I'd have a touching scene where they leave me behind, wouldn't yes. I? And, it was, <laughs> and you had wisdom, right. too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. So I'm like the old shaman guy and they get rid of me because it's like, yeah. Then they put me on like a, like a raft made of reeds and just push me this down a river. Is, it's writing just like, itself, it. man. It is writing itself. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Okay. Well, thank you all for being here. And in a few days, we're going to take another peek inside the chinwag mailbag. It's deep and it, dark. It is there. a huge, it's like Santa's mailbag. It's fucking huge. It really <laughs> is. It's all kinds of amazing stuff in there. And uh, perhaps we'll, we will be responding to your letter, dear listener. So be sure to uh, check that out. And uh, we'll see you then. And until we do, what do we do, Steve? We wag on. We always wag on. <laughs> Chinwag is a production of Tree Fort Media and Touchy Feely Films. Hosted and executive produced by Paul Giamatti and Stephen Asma. Executive producers for Tree Fort are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman. Dan Carey is executive producer for Touchy Feely. Our series producer is Rachel Whitley Bernstein. Original theme music by Luke Topp, with additional music by Via Mardot. Oscar Guido is our executive in charge of production. Tom Monahan is head of audio for Tree Fort. Audio production supervision by Matt Dyson. Editing and mixing by Jeff Neal. Animation created by Alex Sokol. Research assistance by Aiden Brooks. Lastly, for more information, go to chinwagpod.fm and find us on Instagram or TikTok at chinwagpod or on Twitter at chinwag underscore pod. <laughs>